is a global power shift happening? Who's causing it? To whose benefit is it? And what does it mean for the future of the planet? All that and more. Stay tuned. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm really excited for today's interview because I very rarely get to nerd out on this show. And um, I got to nerd out on today's guest podcast, who you know I found from listening to a podcast, which is generally what I do. Um, our guest today is Andrew Heaton, and he is the host of a very cool podcast for those of us that politically we feel abandoned. It's called The Political Orphanage, and I'm excited to have him on today. Thanks for hanging out with me today, Andrew. I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much. We we were we were nerding out about really specific technical <laughs> podcasting stuff here a, a few minutes ago, and like I was like, like you ever talk like a guy that like it's really like excited about like like uh, I, I don't know spark plugs on old cars, and you're like I yeah. don't even like that's how I started to get where I was like oh right, give me that, that 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 one again, and I feel that same way about international relations theory. So I was very very uh, f- charmed and flattered that you reached out to me. So it's it's interesting. Um, I heard you on uh, the Tim Cast, Tim Pool's mm-hmm. podcast, which is one of the few I actually listen to on a daily basis. There's very have, few have, shows. Have you Go been ahead. out to his place in West Virginia? No, I, I pitched him. I, I pitched. I pitched him. They haven't answered me, but I'd like. That's one of the shows I'd love to be on. It, it was a um, lot of fun. It was a lot like it. Um, he has a skate park inside his house. He's doing very well. And uh, had like a couple of secret rooms that you like hit a button and the wall slides like it's like I told him it's like this is you have achieved the 14 year old boy fantasy of like having like 14 year old (laughs) tastes and tons of play money. And then like uh, I ended up we we, it was a fun conversation. We did get a little bit like I don't want to say we argued. We had very different. Kind of it got a little at heated point. at one point, yeah. and you're like, "Tim, I'm not trying to to to, yeah. to argue with you here, but right. yeah." So <laughs> yeah, we, we we did like there 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 was a little bit of like kind of low level horn locking, but but uh, we were, he, he was very magnanimous afterwards. He actually invited me to stick around an extra day, and so uh, whereas uh, Friday night we were kind of like starting to square off. Saturday night ended up with me drinking scotch and watching Star Trek: The Next Generation with Tim Pool. We watched a couple episodes with Q and Data uh, as the main leads, and I was like, "Great, well, this is a great way to end our little." Our little uh, sojourn, and then I flew back to Austin, Texas, where I live. Well, we have, and uh, the thing I think is really funny is how he talks about his chickens. Because um, where where I live here, I mean, I live in New Jersey, and my idea of New Jersey is not most people's. I live on four plus acres. There's a river in my backyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a barn, two dozen chickens, and a pig. Yeah. So like all the chicken things make sense to me because I get all these different color eggs and everything like that. And it's we we love being able to eat off what we uh, what we grow here, man. Uh, I think New Jersey is the most unfairly slagged state in the union. Like you, you, you talk to most people about New Jersey and you're like, oh, New Jersey. I went there one time. It was horrible. I flew into this place called Newark on my oh, way God. to New York City. And I'm like, you can't judge a state by the asphalt corridor that links a major highway or a, a major airport to a major city. Like, new, like the space between Newark and New York City is literally where gangsters dump bodies. That's the whole yep. part. Like it's that is not it's emblematic. Yeah, that's not that's not New Jersey's the Garden State for a reason i've been to edison i thought it was really nice there's lakes there like like it's yeah i, I don't think pe- people basically understand new jersey in terms of the suburbs of new york city which is not yes fair. yeah I, I live about an hour and a half outside of the city so out here it's like there's more more cows than people and all that kind of stuff yeah. so it's it, it's quite interesting but uh but anyway um the thing i was really excited about is i ch- ended up checking out your podcast a political orphanage because i'm like oh man I, that's how i feel I, I feel like you know in a lot of ways i'm very fiscally conservative but i'm socially pretty liberal like you yeah. know you live your life how you want to live your life and it's not my problem yep. um and and because of that like many times i find myself you know voting republican but it's because i don't really find a better option and i think for a lot of people People, they're kind of somewhere in the middle. And um, so I guess for you, uh, kind of before we dive into the topic today, like how did you end up, you know, starting with that? Because it's, it's a very entertaining show. And, and I feel like there's a lot of people that really vibe with that because most people are somewhere in the middle, man. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Um, and I'm glad that you say it's entertaining because I am I am uh, ethnically and vocationally a comedian, but I'm mm-hmm. not quite funny enough to be a full time stand up comedian. I'm not I like I do stand up. I can't I can't do it enough to pay rent. So I I notched it down to very funny pundit. So you're you're getting if you were if you were listening to a stand up show, you'd be like not that good. But for for a pundit, I'm really funny. Um, and in, in terms of like the political orphanage and the bearing that I have for it specifically. Um, 
Um, I, I very much feel what you're saying, and I think we probably have very similar bearings. Uh, I, I am a hedonist. That is to say that, like, whatever you want to, as long as you're not hurting anybody, I completely support you. Like, you want to, like, like you want to drop apid, uh, acid with your thruple? I, if as long as you mow your lawn and pay your taxes, I, I couldn't care less. I'll, I'll, I'll come play board games with you and your thruple. I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't care. Uh, and then when it comes to the fiscal side of things, kind of my position, it's not so much that I think government is evil or inherently bad. I just don't think it's very complicated. Competent. I just like when, when I look at like central planning and and um, technocrats, it's I just I don't think it's going to work very well. So I mm-hmm. tend to kind of approach government from from my perspective being very pragmatically, which is, look, the, the market tends to work pretty well. Let's use like if you're going to take people's stuff or you're going to make them do things. I might back you up on it, but the onus is on you to say why there's a big public need for it and how your solution is going to fix that problem. And and mm-hmm. if you can re- meet those two criteria, I'm all on board. There's lots of examples of like the Clean Air Act and things like that. But when you get into like really complex Rube Goldberg things that like require everybody to change their heart to agree with you, I'm like, I don't think that's going to pan out. I don't think either party really has my back in that regard. And, and I'll add to that. I, I that, wouldn't disagree because they're all kind of like – it's it's interesting because, um, and I'll leave the name out of it, but I, I interviewed a political candidate recently where I kind of outlined before the show, I'm like, these are the things I want to talk about. And then the, the person said to me, oh, well, I can't, if I talk about this, I have to say this because the people that are voting for me want that. And I'm like, but yeah. do you believe that? Like, yeah. like, come on, man. Yeah. Well, then that's, see, that's the other thing is like, I, I'm from Oklahoma. I live in Texas, but I, I am vocationally a comedian or have been. I spent a lot of years living in New York City. Uh, I spent a fair amount of years living in Scotland. I've got a very wide range of people in my life that I I love who I disagree with, who are either Mm -hmm. like conservative Republicans back where I'm from or are flaming pseudo-communists from New York City. And I I can I I have the capability of separating them as a person from their plans to fix things. To me, these are mm-hmm. different phenomena. Of I, I'll give you an example. I think raising minimum wage would be a bad idea. I think I think it would it would be counterproductive. I think it would it would lead to layoffs and it would it would halt the it would basically end up hurting all the people we're trying to help. Right. But if you're in favor of raising the minimum wage, I get what you're trying to do. You're trying to help poor people. I don't think it's going to work. But my problem's not with you as a person. In fact, I think your right. bearings are probably pretty good. I just think you've got a bad plan. Right. And I, I well, find and, and that- the problem with that, too, because I, I you mentioned that on, on the Tim Pool show, too. And that's yeah. that's one of the things that I uh, minimum wage is a real annoying issue for me, because, number one, I'm a business owner. Mm-hmm. So I look at it and I'm like. Okay, so if it's $15 an hour, now all those goods are going to cost more. So your $15 an hour isn't worth the $15 I gave you. So it's kind of like this repeating cycle of a big problem. Yeah, there's there's a real I, I did an episode on the show. If anybody wants to check out kind of the political economy kind of thing, there's an episode titled The One Thing Governments Can't Do um, that came out on the political orphanage about six months ago. And kind of like if, if I could contribute one thing to the field of eco- uh, economics, it's that governments cannot mandate intention. They can only mandate incentives. So like no government in the history of mankind can say, Jeremy, you have to like the janitors who work in your building and you have to treat them better. They can't. What they can say is, Jeremy, we're going to fine you if you don't pay your janitors more or we're going to give you subsidy if you pay them more. We can't say you have to like them. And what I mean by that is I'll hear from friends sometimes that will go, we should have a rule that no CEO can make 10 times more than the lowest employee in the company. And I'm like, right. What you're saying is I want CEOs to care about paying their employees more. But what you're actually telling them is we're going to punish you if there's a gap. So what they're going to do is they're going to fire all the poor, like all the lowest people in their company, and they're going to outsource it to another company. Like that's, that's how all of this works. And you have to kind of grasp that. Otherwise you're, you're shooting in weird directions all the time. Um, yep. But b- back to, back to the kind of the overall point though, I have lots of friends who are Democrats and Republicans and Libertarians. Um, I, I used to be a writer at Fox Business, but at my going away party, there was a full-blown capital C communist and a Lincoln impersonator. I'm very capable of being friends with people that I disagree with, and I like it, and I need it because I've been wrong about a ton of stuff, and I assume I'm wrong about a ton of stuff. So I want to have different viewpoints that are challenging me on a regular basis. 
I I find that the two party system doesn't cater to me. And I, I think that the Republicans and the Democrats have figured out that the best way to really motivate their base is to sell fear and hatred. And I will not do it. I, I don't think that that's where we need to be as a country. I think we need to figure out ways to work with each other. We need to have arguments, right? We need to have passionate arguments. But there's a difference between I'm angry at you, which Tim and I were uh, the other night, versus I hate you or or, or you yeah. are irredeemable. You know, like there's a difference between contempt and passion. And I think that the, the major parties really prey on that. And I don't like that at all. And so I wanted to create the political orphanage. My show is a space for people that are kind of on board temperamentally. And there's it's it, it's a temperamental union. That is to say that most of the people that listen to the show probably have similar bearings to you and I, Jeremy, of of being kind of skeptical of government efficacy. But that's not really the clarion call. It's more of like, look, do you want to solve problems? And can you be friends with people you disagree with? Like, because yep. that's really it. Like, I, I, I'm, I, I've worked in partisan media. I'm really tired of um, our team's the good team. The other team's even e- more evil than you thought. I, I think it's lazy and <laughs> schlocky. And and I think that there's there's a really underserved market of basically smart people that know what's going on and get exhausted by cheerleading and demonizing. And so I'm trying to cater to them and go, all right, look, let's 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 get underneath that partisan bickering and figure out what's actually going on here and see if we can't come up with a good solution to this problem. Well, and, and, you know, the episode I happened to stumble on um, really, you know, talks about people getting along and not getting along in, in kind of a, a higher level way, a le- level way. And uh, that's actually, um, I guess, what your, your study was in, which is international relations theory. And that's what I wanted to discuss today. So I'll, I'll t- just some, some background on me and why I got excited at this. So um, my master's is in early Roman Empire propaganda. Oh, cool. Um, I, that's great. I ro- I wrote my thesis on the tools and mechanics um, and and imagery and propaganda that the Roman emperor, um, you know, the first one, Augustus, used to convince people he was God because he knew he was doing it. And the, here's the thing that's interesting, and you probably see this with your major as well. I feel like you see this in everything that we're experiencing right now. Like you look at it and you're probably like, that's power. That is, um, you know, international relations. That's things that's happening. And I'm like... I could see the propaganda. He's trying to tell people he's God, but he's not quite there yet. So it's yeah. it's an interesting perspective, I think, that brings to, you know, our study brings to kind of the modern game board out there. Yeah. Well, and, uh, like, so my, my undergraduate was in history and world religions. And so, but like, oh, and so I, my, I, my master's is in ancient history. My undergrad is world religions and yeah. history. So there you go. Nice. Okay, man. When I'm in New Jersey, I'm going to hit you up for bail money <laughs> and drinks. We're going to, we're going to have a great time <laughs> in, in, uh, we've got a couple in, great distilleries out here, man. Let me tell you. Nice. I'll go check. It. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. And I, I think that's another thing too is that, um, right now, in addition to, like in in mainstream media in the United States portraying Ukraine versus uh, Ukraine versus Russia, um, most of them are engaging in what I call gutter thinking or teeter totter mm-hmm. thinking. Teeter like I, I'm I'm trying not to be a dick here. Uh, not all not all binary thinkers are stupid. All stupid people are binary thinkers. And and the, the what what I mean by that is. Um, the 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 smallest possible decision you can make is between two data points. If if mm-hmm. if there's only one data point, you're not making a decision. If there's three data points, it's more complicated, right? So, large media outfits always want to boil things down to black or white, blue or red, um, letters or number, whatever. They always want to do two because that's the easiest thing for the mass base of people to understand. And they've gotten in the habit now of communicating everything as Republican versus Democrat. And there are just yep. a lot of the time that's true. But a lot of the time, that's not what we're actually fighting about. Like, that's not it. Maybe it's a proxy. Maybe it's correlated loosely, like with jurisprudence and originalist versus living constitutionalist. But like when you get into foreign policy, it really does. It's not a thing. It's like mm-hmm. like like Bush and Biden are on the same IR policy. Like they, they're yes. not they're not different. Like like you could argue Trump is different, but like Nixon's very different than Bush, Bush, Clinton, other Bush. Uh, 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 Biden, those guys are all cut from the same cloth, right? So like it, it's one of the, and, and you can see mainstream media attempting to revert this back to blue versus red. And, and I'm like, that's not the case. So I wanted to get underneath that. And in addition to all of that partisan bickering, Jeremy, there's also all the propaganda because there is a ton of agitprop going on. We have agitprop. Everybody has agitprop. Everybody has propaganda to some extent. That doesn't mean that I'm an agnostic about this. I think that it was an unethical and illegal violation of international norms for Russia to invade Ukraine. I'm pro-Ukraine. I'm rooting for Ukraine and all those things. But 
they're also probably putting out their own agitprop and psyops. Like my guess is yeah. they've got a really kick-ass social media team that is going out and doing these things, just like Putin is, just like we are to some extent. And uh, and and so having a background in, in propaganda, like it, I, I don't think it went away. It just got more more complex and used different mediums. So that's a cool thing for you to have a background in. Well, and it's it's interesting too, and it's um, I do want to. I guess into this uh, international relations argument, I do want to bring in a little bit of the the Russia Ukraine thing. But what I, what's I guess lay the groundwork first, and then get to that. Um, and and as well, um, I actually listened to your interview uh, with Jen Briney from mm-hmm. uh, the Congressional Dish. So then I actually went and listened to like five of her episodes, and then I'm gonna have her on to actually talk oh, about th- that yeah. whole Jen's, that Jen's whole You really enjoy her. Jen's fantastic. So I I guess like looking at it, let's kind of define some terms here to kind of like, you know, make Mm. this whole thing make sense at at first. I I find you have to be on the right term. So um, international relations, you know, I guess, how do we define that? Because we don't really, as you mentioned, we don't really define it as politics as we think Mm. about it. But how do you define international relations? And then I want to get into the ideas of power and liberalism and how a lot of that comes together. Great. Good question. And I'm really glad we're kicking it off because I think that's that's pretty fundamental to what we're discussing here. So. Foreign policy is the actions the state is taking in terms of its relationship with other states, right? So foreign policy would be uh, right now uh, the Biden administration has given a billion dollars to Ukraine. That's a, that's an, a, we, we, When we're debating foreign policy, we're debating should we be giving Ukraine money? How much money should we be giving them? Um, should we be adding Ukraine to NATO? Uh, should the EU? All those things, right? It's, it's We're debating policy. Right. IR theory is the the bedrock underneath that. International relations theory is really what I call the DNA of war. It is it is us looking at the world and going, what are the fundamental reasons that states go to war? How are what are the the fundamental ways we avoid or contain war? And uh, and beyond that, what is the based on that analysis? How do we make predictions of what states are going to do? And everybody, to some extent, is operating under a theory, regardless of whether they know it or not, because there's just there's really no way there's really no way you could pay attention to the news on any regular basis and approach every single international situation completely unique. You'd have to do so much research. Generally, you've got some kind of heuristic you're using. It might be everybody's a, a bad guy thug and I'm a cynic. It might be. Uh, I don't believe any of the U.S. media. It's all about money. Whatever that is, you've got some kind of thing. So IR sure. theory is that that innate, like, why do nations go to war? What are the root causes of war? And what are the foundational reasons that we can avoid war? Because how what you think based on that is going to have a radically different uh, perspective on the foreign policy that you take. So then when we look at that, um, within that, then what you mentioned uh um, Biden and uh, and Bush being on, um, which W. Bush just aggravates me. But anyway, you mentioned Bush and Biden being on a very similar idea yeah. of power and how they approach things. So I guess within that, you know, what are kind of those approaches within international relations? And, mm-hmm. um, and you know, I, liberalism is kind of the one where they've kind of tried to, to tenure all the other ones. But, you know, what are those approaches within international relations? Right. So there's uh, there are, there are a ton. Like if you get into the actual academic literature, it's all angels dancing on the heads of pins. Right. But uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to basically suck them into the broad camps that they're in um, that mm-hmm. like a, a, an ambassador or somebody at Brookings or, or, or the Pentagon would know what we're talking about. Right. So uh, Bush and Biden are both liberals. And for anybody listening here, I want to be very careful. We're using liberal in a completely different context than than in an American domestic policy discussion. In in America, when we say liberal, we mean a progressive person that favors state solutions to achieve social justice or something to that effect, right? That's not what we're talking about here. You could be a diehard Republican and a liberal in terms of international relations theory. So when I say liberal, I want you to think of classical liberal, because it's all coming out of the Enlightenment, which is what liberal used to mean. It, like, this is why you have libertarians. Like call liberal arts classical and, and things like that, right? Ex- yeah, exactly. Exactly. So this is it, it, it. This is not progressivism. This is that's a separate beast. It's literally foreign policy that developed as a uh, an offshoot of Adam Smith, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, a lot of the kind of foundational Um, political philosophers that plug into the American experience because America is a classical liberal country, right? Um, Liberalism is the idea that war is 
Power politics are important in war. However, war is going to be more frequently agitated by belligerent authoritarian regimes than it is by democratic regimes and by mm -hmm. capitalist regimes. And the thought process is uh, a, a capitalist regime is going to uh, that that's is, is going to first have trade relations with other countries, which means that it's going to have a vested interest in not uh, invading those other countries. Like like it would for America to like attack Canada, like what we wouldn't we would end up spending more money on bombs than we would on just like the amount of maple syrup we get. It doesn't make sense. Like so, right. basically, for, from a rational perspective, open markets make more money for everybody involved than invading them does. So right, yeah, like like in in my freshman year of high school, um, I had this perf this teacher that had me read uh, the lecture and the olive tree, the theory right, of globalization. Tom Friedman. Yeah. And Tom Friedman, um, he talks about this idea of the golden arches theory, which, you know, may or may not be mm -hmm. true because people have invaded people and whatever it is, but it's more of the idea of if we're in the same economic sphere, there's less of an incentive for yeah. us to kind of interrupt that. Right, exactly. And like, an, and a great example of that is Walmart and China. China's an authoritarian regime. No one, least of all me, thinks it's, that it's a liberal or democratic regime. But uh, China's largest trading partner in the world is Walmart. Walmart, the corporation, is bigger than literally every other country that China does trade with. So wow. there, there's a pretty good argument to be made that China's going to think really long and hard about firing any bombs at Arkansas. Uh, because it knows that if it ever went to war with the United States, it would 100% cripple their economy. And meanwhile, it wouldn't be great for Americans either. Like we might be slightly better, but it's basically economically mutually assured destruction, right? So that's mm -hmm. part of the, the liberal view is that interdependent economies are less likely to go to war with each other. It's not a it's not a, a pure rule. It doesn't mean that it will never happen. It just means on balance, interconnected economies are, are more likely to find peaceful solutions to facilitate trade than they are to go with conquest. And adjacent to that is the theory of democratic peace. This is the idea that democratic regimes generally view other democratic regimes as legitimate and are less worried about them. So mm -hmm. uh, like if if Cuba and Canada both suddenly increase their military budget by 20 percent. America is going to react very different to Cuba doing that than it will to Canada. We're going to look at Canada and be like, welcome to the party, Canada. Like, it's not going to no one's going to get afraid of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, the idea is that uh, democratic regimes, one feel uh, they, they feel the effects of war fatigue much greater than authoritarian regimes do. Um, Vladimir Putin doesn't really have to worry about whether his people uh, don't have access to uh, Ikea and iPhones or not. It doesn't affect him. He He's only affected at the point at which somebody kills him. That, that's it almost it. seems like they're like a pseudo democracy as well. Do you know what I mean? Like it's because they, they have voting, but like yeah. Putin's not going to lose. <laughs> they're they're, they're what, what we used to call a vertical democracy. And I would caution yeah. anybody, any democracy with a hyphen in it is bullshit. Any, any <laughs> democracy with a hyphen in it is just a thug that wants the credit as a democracy. No, very much. It, it, it is a sham democracy. Um, it, would, it would be the equivalent of imagine if our current president, Joe Biden, was able to abolish by law the Republican Party and and the Libertarian Party, uh, but there was like a rump state of green candidates that no one ever voted for that was the opposition. And so you had to be a Democrat, but there was also like kind of theoretically opposite. But if they got too big, we'll shoot them like that's about where they're at. And then also imagine that he abolished uh, uh, democratically elected governors and appointed all of them because uh, mm -hmm. Putin did that about 10 years ago. Um uh, but but yeah, basically the idea that, that democratic regimes are the, the, if if we don't have IKEA and we don't have uh, iPhones and all these things, the voters get really pissed off and, and switch parties, right? So um, liberal liberal theory is democratic capitalist regimes are going to be more inclined to peace, particularly with each other. And so the way that we avo avoid war and the way we promote peace globally is to enfranchise more and more countries into the liberal democratic open market order that the United States is a part of, what we oftentimes call the free world during the the Cold War. And the way that we accomplish that is by enfranchising people into institutions which facilitate these ends. So like NATO is a very good example of this. NATO mm -hmm. is a, a, a military compact between other broadly secular, liberal, capitalist countries that are all a part of the same club. Turkey, 
little bit of an asterisk there, but when it joined in the 90s, it would have qualified as well. Another good example of this is the European Union. Um, people have their thoughts on whether the EU is bad or good and thoughts on Brexit and all of that. But in terms of keeping Germany and France from murdering each other, been pretty good. Uh, like nobody in the EU is worried about anybody else in the EU invading them. Like Europe is now at peace. The EU has been pretty good for that. Um, the WTO is a good example. The World Trade Organization, which uh, when you bring on Jen Briney, she hates that. But I, <laughs> but I'm very much a, a neoliberal shill, so I'll I'll pan for it. Um, uh, the the WTO is basically a club where if you if you enter it, you can't charge any members higher rates than any other members uh, in terms of tariffs. So if I've got I can have a 10% tariff on oranges, but I can't, I can't charge Germany 12% and France 8%. I have, I have to do everybody the same amount. And basically, I, I guess I'm kind of in the same boat with Jen on that one then, because I think we should charge China a lot, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, and, and, you know, that, th that would be the, the, the counter position would either be protectionism is good or, or alternately you could take kind of the nominal Donald Trump or Elizabeth Warren position that trade is a, uh, something we can use for leverage to get other countries to quit doing bad things. Uh, but mm -hmm. the idea behind the WTO is basically that it's a ratchet system that you can never go below a certain amount of free trade. That's kind of the mm -hmm. idea behind it. Uh, and that, that all factors into that democratic piece. So when you get to like George W. Bush and Biden, their their whole game plan is we're trying to get as many new countries into this world order, into the free world as we can, because we think that every time we get a country in, they are they're fire retardant now when another country goes crazy. They now have asbestos in them. They now have a good a good uh, uh, plumbing hydraulic system and all of that kind of stuff. So if North Korea flares up, we don't have to worry about South Korea. If if Russia flares up, don't worry, Poland's now on team NATO. Right. So that's what they're doing. And really, the big fire in foreign policy circles in my entire lifetime has not been between conservatives and Democrats. It's been an internal debate between liberals. And, and basically, it's just been multilateral versus unilateral. So the multilateralists would go, yes, we need to be encouraging these things. Um, we might even want to do regime change. But we want to do it with our allies. So if we're going to go in and we're going to topple Saddam Hussein, well, we want to make sure we've got France and Germany and the United Kingdom on board. And we, we kind of want the whole liberal order to come with us. Whereas the unilateralists like George W. Bush go, we need to encourage these liberal regimes. Uh, we need to enfranchise them into the system. But we'll go do it on our own, even if Germany doesn't want to come with us. And that's really been the fight. The fight's never been about should we be expanding the liberal world order or not. It's just been do we do it alone or not. Um, tr Trump is a big caveat to this because Trump is not a liberal. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't. I, I frankly think Trump is some sub ideological. I don't think he has an ideological bearing. Um, if anything, he's probably more akin to a realist, which we'll talk about next. But he's not yep. a liberal. But everybody else has been a liberal in my lifetime. And now a word from our sponsors. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z pack Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. You can support the wellness company by heading over to twc.health slash JRS. That is twc.health slash JRS. Get up to 15% off select products. Support the wellness company and help support this show. Thanks again. Well, one of the th before we get into realist, like one of the things I, I I have to ask you now because you mentioned it um, is you, you look at somebody like like George W. Bush, like hey, hey, hey we're going to bring democracy to the world. Yeah. Um, but like, if you're bringing democracy by the butt of a gun, like, is it really democracy? And you look at like like what somebody like. Um, you know, the name makes me want to vomit, but Victoria Newland, you look at a lot of what she's done and, and like, let's start some color revolutions in all these countries. Like, is that really bringing democracy and bringing those people in the world order and kind of like pulling their hair to get them there? Yeah, you raise a very good point. I mean, and this is when we get into foreign policy stuff on the foreign policy side, I am an intervention skeptic. That is to say that I am not opposed to intervention. There are situations like I oh, think sure. NATO, NATO intervening in like ethnic genocides going on in Central Europe. That, okay, makes sense to me. You know, like there, yeah. there are situations where I think the international Yeah, like in the Balkans when we had to go in and handle yeah. some of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, 
Nazi Germany, pretty good example. Yeah. Uh, so that there are, but but generally speaking, though, my my default would be don't go unless there's a really good reason to do it. Like don't don't go because somebody like you see an interesting tweet and you're like, we should bomb them because uh, we have a really good track record, a really good track record of finding dictators and going, hey, do you want some guns? If you shoot these people we don't like, we'll give you guns. And then about like a month later, they're like, ah, we're going to shoot you now. We never see it coming. We do this all the time. We armed Saddam Hussein. We armed the Taliban. Um, and we also have a track record of, of not just trying to promote liberal institutions. And this is one of the things that sort of militates against liberalism. We also have a pretty good track record of knocking out democratically elected regimes when they are no longer in the interests of the United States. So yeah. Iran, Iran's a great example of this because like Iran, we're like, oh, why does Iran hate us? We're such a great country. Well, in, in the 70s, they had a democratically elected president who wanted to nationalize mm-hmm. their oil reserves. And the United Kingdom and the United States went, well, we would rather than be private companies that sell it to us cheap. So we went in, we ousted their their democratically elected president. We put in a monarch that liked America. And like, so we, we do that occasionally. Uh, but Dan yes, Carlin, I, by, Dan Carlin has a great podcast on that, on, uh, on uh, Hardcore History Addendum, actually. He did recently. Oh, so if people want to go is check. There, is there a separate podcast called Addendum? So he has, he has Hardcore History and then he has Hardcore History Addendum. These are the things that don't really fit with his main oh. feed, but subjects he wants to talk about. So he actually yeah. talks about that exact one about, you know, the Shah and why did we do it? And, you know, they were actually much more of a liberal country before we went into yeah. liberalize them, yeah. uh, which is quite an interesting perspective, which, by the way, I, I thought you were Dan Carlin when I first was listening to uh, your interview with <laughs> I take anyway. that as a great compliment. <laughs> it's just basically Dan Carlin plus a couple drinks. I would love yeah. for that to be my thing. That sounds wonderful. Um, yeah, to, to your point, I, I think that that is a, a very big criticism of the 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 liberal IR theory uh, and even liberals that are very dedicated to it will acknowledge that um, because liberals tend to view democratic regimes as more legitimate and more peaceful than other countries there's always this temptation to go on a crusade and knock out the bad guys because liberal mm-hmm. IR theory tends to tends to kind of facilitate a worldview of the free world versus the authoritarians and they're mm-hmm. illegitimate and bad and so if we can like knock that king off the chessboard and put in a different king maybe it'll work with with bush um iraq is a really good touchstone for what you think ir theory is about um we'll get to marxism in a minute but but marxists and and again in the same way that liberal means a different thing in ir theory sure. than it does domestically when i say marxist it definitely has a lineage coming out of of marxism but don't think of it so much as commies think of it more as like um ir theory that just thinks the underlying motivation for everything is economic so that like a a um, a liberal would look at uh, uh, the the Iraq war and more or less take it on face value and say um, Saddam was very dangerous at the time. We were wrong, but we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. We thought it was necessary to go in. Uh, and and then if you if you kind of get behind the scenes and you start to look at what they were actually saying in, in the Pentagon and stuff, basically the Bush administration thought that if we could facilitate a democratic regime in in Iraq that there would be a domino effect and the other surrounding countries would realize how wonderful uh, open markets and democratic elections are and the Middle East would begin to percolate into a democratic part of the world. That was the thought process. Uh, that did not happen at all. Whereas a Marxist would look at it and go, no, it was about oil. You guys just wanted oil. I I, I do think they actually believe that was going to happen. I'm I'm not economically cynical about the the war in Iraq, but but I kind of I'll invoke Talleyrand and say it's not so much that it was illegal, it's that it was incompetent. Uh mm-hmm. they were dead wrong about that. We weren't welcomed as liberators, all those things. Well, it, you know the thing I struggled with that, Andrew, is is there is I, I kind of see both perspectives, right? Because you have, you know, Dick Cheney who like Oh, I, I don't know how the guy's still living. The number of heart attacks he's had, and you know why we just can't. He's got a know, robot he, heart. Fun fact about Dick Cheney: up until uh, he's, he's got a heart transplant now. For a mm-hmm. while, he had like a, an artificial heart. He did not have a pulse for years wow. because his his blood was on a continuous circuit. Like it was just this big loop of blood. Now he's got a heartbeat again. But like, well, for a while, he's got a no heart. Pulse. He's got a he's got a heartbeat. But it's still up for debate whether he has a soul or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, like I look at that and I'm like, okay, well, you know, looking at Dick Cheney, I think it was about oil. But then you look at the other side of it, and you know, I can look at what happened with Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, and like they seem to think like like I think Colin Powell was a pretty stand up guy, and he I think he actually thought they were disarming yeah. them, and right. there turned to be nothing. Yeah, and it and it did and. Cheney's the most interesting one because Cheney knew better. Like you can go back and watch. So Cheney was what? Um, Secretary of, 
I don't think he was he defense under George H. W. Bush or that was Rumsfeld as well, right? Yeah, um, I think he was in energy, wasn't he? Or no? I, I don't remember. I'm gonna have to I, look it up now. He 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 was involved. He might have been defense under George H. W. Bush because I've I've watched a video where George H. W. Bush, who was a lot more prudent in his international adventuring than his son was. Um, goes into Iraq, or excuse me, goes into Kuwait, ousts Saddam Hussein from Kuwait during his incursion, and then he stops. Uh, like, mm-hmm. like I, I was friends with a, a senator back in Oklahoma who was actively in the Senate during that he time. He was the went, 17th Secretary of Defense from 1989 uh, okay. until 1993. You're correct. Right. Okay. Um, so this, the senator I knew went to the White House, talked to George H.W. Bush, and was like, we can totally take Baghdad. Like, we, we've got the gas money. We've got all, like, the Japanese are funding it. And George H.W. Bush went... You know, what's your exit strategy? Once we get in there, how do we get out of there? Like, I, we're just we're just going to push them out of Kuwait and go home. And uh, and you can watch this video of Secretary of Defense uh, Dick Cheney when they go, why aren't we going into Baghdad? And he it's a ama- he goes, the reason we're not going into Baghdad is because right now Saddam Hussein is keeping a tense peace on a sectarian conflict between Sunni and Shia, plus there's the Kurds up north. And if we think if we get rid of Saddam Hussein, we will unleash a horrible bloody civil war in Iraq that'll be worse than what we're doing right now. And that's and that's exactly what they do under George W. Bush. Like it's amazing mm-hmm. the, the volt face he has. I'm I'm guessing Cheney was just saying the party line back in the day. Uh, but yeah, good example of of American adventuring abroad not working. But still, yeah. at the same time, though, I'd say that is motivated by liberal by liberal stuff. Uh, at least with like yeah, Bush, Condoleezza Rice. Uh, and and Colin Powell, obviously, I can't see into their heart. But based mm-hmm. on the documents I've read and the the underlying thinking of the the Bush administration, the thought process was um, we can um, uh, oust the evil authoritarian bad guy mm-hmm. and enfranchise Iraq into the democratic open markets world order, and that in turn will facilitate the liberal world order in the Middle East, and it'll begin to percolate elsewhere. That was the thinking. There's an author, um, Jim Mars. I don't know if you heard of him. He wrote the book, uh, uh, The Plot to Kill Kennedy, which is what Oliver Stone's movie JFK is based on. Hmm. Um, and and there's a, a a clip of him talking about uh, George H or George W. Bush, and he says that uh, George Bush is what we call in Texas a post turtle. You don't know how the, to- the 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 turtle got up on the fence post, but you just want to help help the darn creature down. Um, <laughs> yeah. So so anyway, um, uh, that joke kind of fell flat. Um, but uh, you know, I guess you're a better comedian than I am. Um, you, you look at, and I'm, uh, I'm a bad audience too. I apologize, yeah. Jeremy. I'm a bad audience. <laughs> I I just I like I literally I'll go to comedy shows and like this is how I laugh at a comedy show. That was good. That was really funny. And then I'll like remember to go talk to the guy afterwards. And be like, I really enjoyed it, but I won't laugh out loud. So yeah. like, don't feel bad. And, well, anyway, I guess bringing in the other. So we've we've looked at this this kind of idea, the liberal viewpoint, and and I want to get into to the realists and what they think. So you know, what is a realist, um, and I, I guess how does that play in all this? Is that right. more like the traditional risk type model, or or, or what yeah, is that? No, exactly. You've nailed it. Um, so so like in the American uh, international relations experience, the big two are liberals that we just discussed and realists that we're about to discuss. There are other ones as well. Um, I think you see a lot of Marxist a uh, Mark Marxist I our theory in media, you don't tend to see it in foreign policy circles. There's really not anybody at Brookings or the Pentagon that has a Marxist viewpoint, but we can talk about that later. So the the other big one is realism. And realism is sort of the old granddaddy theory of IR relations. Like realism is what Cardinal Richelieu and Otto von Bismarck were using. Um, And in modern history, it's what Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon were using. So realists like, like liberals look at IR theory and, and they are concerned with institutions and facilitating democracy and open markets to facilitate peace. That's, that's mm-hmm. the mindset of liberals. Realists say this is billiard balls. The, the, like like the, it's power is the physics that animate states. And whether they're a dictatorship or a democracy is is just the flavor of the state. But the state itself is just a, a conglomeration of power looking to exert its power over other countries, looking to forestall exertion over it. So very much like Risk. Uh, if you've ever played the board game Risk, like you're 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 just looking to conquer the world or not be conquered in the board game Risk. You you don't like make alliances and Risk because your friend is Catholic. And you're Catholic, you know, and you decide like, no, you're both you're both trying to get Australia. You don't mm-hmm. care. You're not you're not going to give Australia away. Right. So the, the way realists look at IR theory is we live in a big anarchic globe. 
there is no there is no rule of law above that of the nation state. The nation state is the highest rule of law. There are clubs and things that you can be a part of, but they're all they're all bilateral. What that means is you and I have agreed to be a part of this club. It would like like the difference would be like if law and the states were made by all of the governors agreeing to do it and they could leave anytime they wanted, as opposed mm-hmm. to having like Congress and the presidency, right? There's no sure. equivalent of Congress and the presidency. It's more of like a confederacy. Stage. It's more of like a confederacy yes, in that way, right? Very much so. Yeah. And and so that's it. That's like governor's the highest you get. There's nothing above that. There's no Congress. There's no president. And what that means is there's no policeman and there's no judge. There's no international court that can actually swoop in and do things. There is the International Criminal Court, but it only applies if you want to be a member of it. Yep. Uh, you don't. You don't have to. Like no one can haul you in front of the International Criminal Court. It's just you agree to do it because you think it's. But you could also pull out of it at any time. So re- realists look at the world and go, it's just about power. And because it's just about power, what's what's happening and what's really animating countries to to do things is countries are their primary goal is to not be invaded their primary mm-hmm. goal is to maintain the regime whatever that regime is and everything else will eventually take a backstop to it i.e the united states which is a liberal democratic regime well we'll ally with the soviet union we'll ally with a bunch of commies if we need to go fight the nazis mm-hmm. uh, it's not all going to be ideological for us the ideology is great but it's secondary to just raw power which is why we allied with the soviet union or for that matter probably why we're allies with saudi arabia which is a despotic medieval feudal regime that has nothing in common with american civil values but when push comes to shove it's about power so uh, that's that's where realists are at and the solution that realists have is basically a a reliance on deterrence that because power is ultimately the language everybody speaks and everything else is at the margins, the way that you avoid war is by having a a big enough military presence that other countries don't want to push you around. And that Mm -hmm. it's kind of the, the, the well-armed society is a polite society. That logic is applied to the international area of if everybody has a lot of guns, they're probably not going to fight each other as much. So so it's Uh, the idea of uh, speak softly and carry a big stick for the, the, the Teddy Roosevelt quote. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, the, the, another part of this is spheres of influence. Um, uh, so, and this is, this is really the fault line right now between realists and, and liberals is the spheres of influence thing. So under, under traditional realist theory, because countries are billiard balls and, and they've got little satellite States around them that are either ally with them and bandwagon with them, or will maybe form a coalition to, to fight them. There's sort of an acknowledgement that, Great powers are going to have this orbit around them that they're going to want to protect, and they're they're going to not want people in. Mm-hmm. Um, the United States has the Monroe Doctrine, uh, and, and our our foreign policy has been since Monroe: um, no other foreign power, no big power, can hang out in the Western Hemisphere. If anybody takes Canada or Mexico, we're going to fight them. If anybody, like if China or Russia tries to set up military bases in Argentina, we're going to fight them. That's been our policy for years. No one questions this in American foreign policy. Like if if Mexico wanted to let in military bases from China, we would invade Mexico tomorrow. I mean, it's just this this is our position. Yeah. So realists are looking at the current conflict with Ukraine and going, yeah, Russia's got the exact same thing with Ukraine. Russia is a historic great power. They see themselves as needing a buffer state on their eastern fl- or their western flank to keep their historic enemies, France and uh, Germany, from invading them or whoever it is, America or whatever. And so basically um, what we should have done as realists is we should have tried to keep Ukraine neutral or just acknowledge that it's Russia's backyard. One of those two things, either, hey, sorry, it sucks that Russia gets to push you around, but that's how life is in the same way that we, we're going to push around Mexico. Or maybe maybe we should have pushed like, hey, let's all agree that Ukraine is not going to get sucked into anything and it's going to be a demilitarized zone, something like that. But The more that we agitate to enfranchise Ukraine and the Baltic states to NATO and the European Union and the Western world order and the free world, we're provoking a very paranoid, powerful country. And that by doing so, we have basically pushed them into war. They're still the unethical people. We're not morally responsible for it, but our hubris and our our kind of infatuation with, with liberal rhetoric has led us to be blind to the consequences of doing these things. So realists are basically saying, look, we have really overreached and we have uh, we have irritated Russia the same way that we would be irritated if the Chinese tried to set up missiles in Vancouver pointed at Seattle. And as a result, we've provoked a response from them. We need to back off and make peace. Liberals conversely go, no, Peace comes from democracy and and markets. And so what we need to do is keep expanding global peace as much as we can. So the ideal would be to bring in Ukraine 
to this order. Get them into the EU. Get them into NATO. Because then maybe someday Russia will capitulate and join our, our global order. And realists go, that's crazy. That's not going to happen. Like if if Russia even became a legitimate democracy, we'd still probably fight them over stuff. So we need to respect their zone of influence. And that's the real fissure line right now in IR theory. So I, I guess like looking at it, um, and and I feel like you're going to tell me I'm a realist after I try and like kind of think this out out loud here. Um, but uh, like looking at it, it seems like it's almost um, kind of like a competition between two different IR theories looking at each other, mm-hmm. um, right? It seems like you know the West is coming with this idea of of of, of uh, more of a liberalism, and you know Putin's coming in with more of a power idea. Because I think I, I don't think he's crazy. Um, I don't think mm-hmm. he's justified in his actions. But at the right. same time, to a certain extent, we we may have provoked him trying to yeah. bring bring Ukraine into the liberal order because you look at uh, I don't know if you've heard the recorded phone call between uh Victoria Newland I can't remember who the heck she's talking to I think it's the the ambassador Richard anyway um name escapes me but where that's one where she talks about um you know we're going to bring in Yatsenyuk um I don't think we're going to bring in uh Klitschko because Klitschko isn't the right guy mm-hmm. but they're talking about like what's basically going to happen before the Maidan coup happens right and you know the maidan coup happens everything changes and um you know putin kind of looks at this thing and he gets pissed off so i guess like looking at it like how do we kind of like look at that whole thing and 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 kind of take those two those two viewpoints and 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 make it work yeah so two great points you brought up that i'm really glad you hit on one you can condemn vladimir putin as a bad guy without thinking he's crazy and this is something that i think people need to point out like yeah i don't think he's nuts i just think he's like Let's go kill. Let's go uh, demolish right. some stuff. D- Darth Vader, like for any, for any other nerds out there, you can be lawful evil in D and D. Like you you can be rational but bad, right? So like Darth mm-hmm. Vader is is rational. Like Darth Vader's not crazy. He's not the Joker with ray guns, but he's not good, right? So he's yes. he's functioning. He he is mentally coherent and unethical. And I would I would Correct. posit that that Vladimir Putin is in that same camp. He's not a good person, but he's not a crazy person. Um, and and a lot of people are not getting that right now, and it, it bothers me. I, I think generally when analysts go, I don't know, he must be crazy. That but that this is where says, my propaganda viewpoint comes in because everybody says you know like the viewpoint is. Putin bad, put a Ukrainian flag on everything. Right. Now, I've been to Ukraine. I love Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are amazing people, but I think that's also the wrong way to look at it. I, I, I think whenever you start to go, people I don't like must be nuts. That's a really good time to investigate your preconceptions. Yep, if, if you're 100%. like, and this goes domestically as well. When you look at progressives in America or, or, or conservatives in America and you go, I just, I can't see how they got there. They must be absolutely batshit crazy. Mm-hmm. That means they're, they're operating on some system that, that, that you do not see and you need to think harder. And, and particularly yeah, that's when why, we're dealing that's with, why, like, I can't listen to somebody like, um, like Sean Hannity because it's like, he's like, let's blow everything up. It's like, let's, let's not do that and go there, dude. Like calm down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's the first thing. The, the second thing is there is this conflict of IR theory. I think you're right about that. So, um, my, my position is, uh, I think, I don't think that IR theory has to necessarily be inherently, um, inherently juxtaposed for us. Like, I, mm-hmm. I think that when you really get into it, I think that at the base level, most IR theories, including liberals, sort of acknowledge that power is the top thing. Like, if you were going to identify one big factor, it's going to be power. The, the the main difference is realists are like, that is 90% of all factors. Everything else is window dressing. Whereas liberals would say like, power is like 60 to 70% of the factors we're talking about. But there's an additional 30 to 40% that does make a difference. And that is markets, institutions, and, and democracy, right? So they're not necessarily like completely contravened. It's sort of like, sure. how, how much of a realist are you versus how nuanced are you in, in your interpretation of realism? I think that's one way to look at it. Where I wind up is, I think that liberalism is very useful in terms of uh, how we approach allies and neutral countries. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think that like um, liberalism has been very good at keeping the peace in Europe. Like, like that's that's liberalism that did that. It wasn't realism. If we were realists, uh, like Germany and France would be rearming right now. And yes. that would be the thing keeping the peace. We didn't do that. We, we, we went liberal institutional order a la the European Union and the Schengen Agreement and NATO. Those things worked very well. So when we're dealing with allies, I think we should think like liberals. We should be thinking about how do we strengthen NATO commitments? How do we how do we keep countries plugged into this club that we've created and see that it's worth their while? But when we're assessing our rivals, I think we need to think like realists. So when we're looking at Putin, when we're looking at uh, the, uh, at uh, Xi Ping in China, 
they're not, I don't think that they're ideologues. I don't think that they're, they're going, I don't think Putin's going home and reading Adam Smith. I don't think that, that, that Peng is actually going home and reading Marx. I think that they are looking at a risk board with a bunch of troops and they've got one of those little croupiers and they're pushing the troops around. I think that's how they're thinking. And Mm -hmm. certainly in terms of predicting what they're going to do. And ultimately this is the true value of IR theory is you're, you're predicting what other States are going to do. I think realism is the most useful when you're looking at people that scare you assume that they are also realists because that's probably more often than not going to be the thing that's going to work. There are some caveats to this. Uh, if, if, if I am correct and, um, and it's just big power politics, it does kind of throw the cold war into a little bit of intellectual disarray. Um, the cold war actually, I think makes more sense in a liberal framework than it does a realist framework. Uh, mm-hmm. because in, in the cold war, America broadly thought we're, we're the free world. We're fighting a bunch of commies that, that believe in really c- contrary stuff than we do. Uh, and if you're a realist, you'd go, no, it's just another big country. It doesn't really matter. They could be democratic. We'd still be fighting them. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't really think that's true. I think that if it Russia was more had of been, an, it felt like more it was more of an ideological thing. Like, right. like you know, we were fighting the idea. It's the reason we had you know the Red Scare and all these other crazy Very things so, happening right. at the same time. Like, if you were a communist, you were bad. Right, and that fits in with liberal theory because liberal theory would say there is a qualitative important distinction between a democratic capitalist regime and an authoritarian closed regime, and and they would say absolutely you've hit the nail on the head. This was a fight of two different global civilizational worldviews, and and the Cold War was the friction between them. Whereas realists would go, nope, there's just big countries and little countries, and the big countries fight each other, right? And so and I'm like, well, I think the realists would actually be wrong about that. I think that if if uh, if 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 instead of Putin. The, the Russian Federation had had a legitimate open election and they would began the process of having a real democracy. And I don't think we'd really have a problem with them today, nor they with us. So I, I think that there's something to be said on that. Um, but yeah, those are the, the friction lines. And so the, the kind of the friction is, um, do other leaders have a different IR theory that they're operating under? Because that's going to make us second guess each other. And then also, based on what we think, should we be A, uh, trying to make a rapprochement with Putin and go, you know what? This is your historic backyard. We're going to like, like the best case scenario here is that you get out of Ukraine and we're kind of neutral on it. We both take a hands-off approach. Or do we go the liberal route and go, no, fuck you, Putin. We're going to add Ukraine to NATO. We're going to add Ukraine to the European Union and we're going to tighten that noose around you, right? Uh, that's the real the real conflict that we're having right now in American foreign policy. But And it's interesting because though, though doing that, like, what do you expect the guy to do at the same time? You know what I mean? Like, it, it's do you think you're just going to push and see what happens? Like, I, I, that's the thing I struggle with on that, because at the yeah. same well, time, it, like, yeah, you know, he he's he's already said, like, he sees it as a threat. And um, and I guess mentioning that that podcast that uh, that Jen did about um, about understanding Putin, which was interesting because the media also plays like very select clips of what Putin had to say as well. So we don't even have a full understanding of what he thinks. Yeah, Uh, I I think you're very right about that. I think that, um, as I said, I'm a realist when it comes to our rivals. And for that reason, I I am a realist in regards to Putin. And so my inclination is is that of John Mearsheimer, that um, NATO is not ethically responsible for this in the sense that we are not the guys that pulled the trigger, but we did precipitate this. By mm-hmm. by freaking out Putin in the same way that if if Russia allied with Canada and Russia started bringing warships into Lake Superior and doing military drills, we would freak the fuck out about that. And that's oh, exactly yeah. what's happening in Russia's. We we started doing naval maritime war exercises with Ukraine and the Black Sea. That's like that's them doing it in, in Lake Superior for us. Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, George W. Bush in 2008 said, we're going to add Ukraine and Georgia to NATO. A month later, Russia invaded Georgia. And um, uh, a couple of years later, they took Crimea. Uh, mm-hmm. So like, like the, these are like, to me, there's a very clear reason that, that, that Putin is becoming more and more aggressive. And that's that he views Ukraine joining the Western sphere is pretty much the exact same way we would if Russia were able to, Russia and China were to form a cabal and invite Mexico and Canada to join it. We would freak out about that. Yeah. Uh, and that's, if, if they were putting missile bases in Vancouver uh, or, or Toronto, we would freak out about that. And that's basically what's happening. I think where it gets more ominous, um, the, the immediate situation that you very accurately point out, Jeremy, is where does he go? 
Um, like, like th this isn't risk. Uh, this isn't a situation where we conquer Russia and then we all shake hands and go home at the sleepover. Like, right. like this, like, like Russia persists. So like Russia, a has nuclear weapons, which is something we should always be thinking about because world war three is the last thing anybody wants. It is the end of humanity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, beyond that, um, we ought, we ought to be asking ourselves one, to what extent do we want to piss off an entire generation of Russians that might otherwise have trade relations with us and things like that. Um, and to what extent are we going to back Putin into a corner that he can't emerge from that makes him make erratic bad decisions, which is not a good thing either. I, I think, I, I think regard we're going to, somebody's going to have to offer him a fig leaf. Like, like yes. basically what's going to have to happen is someone's going to have to go, um, Hey, Russia, man. Oh, you guys sure showed us. Wow. You really took the Donblast region. I mean, man, Russian tanks there. You're very virile. I bet you could bend a horseshoe around your erection, Vladimir. That's how much of a man you are. Uh, he, since we've lost, here's all we ask. Leave the rest of Ukraine alone and agree that it's going to be neutral. We're going to admit defeat and, and say that they're neutral as well. We won't try to add them to NATO. You want, somebody's going to have to do that. Um, where this really gets ominous from a realist perspective is, again, from, from a realist perspective, it's billiard mm -hmm. balls, right? It's great power politics. It's power dynamics. Ideology is secondary. So if sure. you're a realist, um, you're looking at global politics over the last 40 years, and you're going during the Cold War, the globe existed with two superpowers that were vied against each other. And that was the balance of power on the world stage. The Soviet Union implodes. And for 20 years, there is a American hegemony. Uh, hegemonies are unstable and temporary under realist theory because other countries will inevitably couple up to fight whatever the big power is. There can't be one empire. And we're now right, seeing I, that. I think the, the Greek states are the best example of that, right? There was always another hegemon. And because of that, it was never a united territory. Yes. And, and they will, yeah, coalitions will form to oppose the big guy. Uh, no, nobody rolls over. Uh, so, and that's basically what we're saying is we're seeing the realignment of the global stage to accommodate that, that implosion that happened with the Soviet Union. What's happening now and the, the period that we're now moving into, we were, we were a two power system under the cold war. We were like an eight power system prior to that with Germany and France and all those things. We were a unipower system during the post cold war era. And now we're moving into a three power world of Russia, America, and China. And mm -hmm. if that is the case, then America needs to be thinking very hard about whether we want to be like neutral with one of them and get them to piss the other one off and play them against each other or whether we want them to be buddies pissed off at us and that yeah. would be the, the worst one so like john mearsheimer would say like right now we're basically driving china and russia to ally with each other and this is very dangerous territory what we need to do is pull a richard nixon and have nixon go to russia and and basically be friendly enough with Putin that that he that that Russia and China don't form a an, an alliance together and and rather they remain neutral or even opposed and we need to be stirring up shit with them we need to be figuring out problems along their border and like send money to get their their TikTok people to make fun of the Chinese and vice versa things like that because what we don't want to have is uh, like you know uh, we, we, if, if there's three of us you'd rather be on the two versus one than the one versus two and and yeah. that's the ominous future we're looking at. Well, I'm, I'm glad you stipu stipulated which version of pulling a Richard Nixon we're, we're talking about too, by the way, because there's, there's, <laughs> there's a couple different versions of that. Uh, you know, one which includes, you know, spying on your competitors, another yeah. one which is pulling us off the gold standard, but in this case, yeah. uh, it's with China. Well, yeah. you know, well, as again, when, when, I, when I invoke uh, Nixon as a realist, I, I, again, you have to you have to separate your, your international relations brain from your domestic brain. Mm -hmm. Like on the realist stage, like, like uh, when Nixon came into office, the official position of the United States government was that the People's Republic of China is an illegitimate government because it's a it's a communist regime that seized power by means of force. The real government of China is the Republic of China living in exile in Taiwan. That's that is as far as we're concerned, the legitimate government of China. Nixon went, guys, there's about a billion red Chinese that all think that Beijing is in charge. Can we just acknowledge and so he flew over and he did that. He's like, you guys are the Chinese government. America's not going to pretend anymore. We're going to, you're the, for whatever reason, you guys got the guns. We're going to, we're going to work with you. We're just going to treat you. And that's the realist position is like, let's not do a lot of window dressing. Let's just acknowledge power for power. Well, the, the last thing I want to let you uh, ask you, Andrew, because I know I, I we're running a little bit low on time here and I want to make sure I value your time. The, 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 the last thing I wanted to ask you, because this came up when you were talking about Putin and how he thinks and, and, and whatever, um, 
and maybe this is being done in foreign policy circles and, you know, we just don't know about it, but shouldn't we really be be reading who they read, right? Like, shouldn't we be reading Alexander Dugan and understanding how the guy thinks? Shouldn't we be reading, um, you know, studying more Chinese history and understanding how they think? Like, are we doing that or are we just simply reacting to what we see in front of us? I very much think we're reacting to the stuff we see in front of us. I don't That's think it's a very we're... dangerous thing to do. Yeah. Um, you know, and like, like there's I, to, to pull it back to domestic politics. I think this is a, a like you, you can see this happen in the United States all the time um, of of attempting to understand your opponents using your system. So like I had a guy on my program a couple of years ago now named Eric Grossman. He's a political science professor out of Michigan. His thesis is that Democrats tend to form coalitions based on. Uh, based on members, whereas uh, Republicans tend to form coalitions based on ideology. And that's mm-hmm. how they organize and how they communicate. So like when you look at the Republican Party, Trump's a very big exception to this. Republicans, when they're doing their primaries, are arguing about abstract ideological concepts. Um, they they organize based on idea. Like there's the neocons, the libertarians, the social conservatives. They're thinking they they organize based on concepts, and they fight based on concepts. So like, who's the real Republican? Who's the Rhino? Who's the heir to Reagan? Who's the who's the true conservative? That's how Republicans think, right? Mm-hmm. Democrats don't really do that. Like like d- Democrats think in terms of coalition. Democrats mm-hmm. think in terms of like, listen, I'm gay, you're black. I think we could have a pretty good ticket here. Uh, or you know, like, I, well, I got to get the teachers unions on board. They're one of our constituents. Teachers unions. And then also the firefighters and, and like, you know, manufacturers, really. So they're thinking that way. So when Republicans look at Democrats, they go, well, that's clearly bullshit. You must be Marxists because you've got to be as ideological as we are. So when you're saying all this crap about unions and gays and things like that's just to throw us off. You're going home and reading Saul Lipinski and Karl Marx. And that's not true. They're not doing that. Like like Biden's not an ideologue. Uh, he's he, like I he has he, he plugs into various theories, but I don't think well, he's, I, he's I don't think he's that. much of anything anymore. But, you know, yeah, <laughs> right. But then, and then the flip side of the coin, he's an Democrat, empty suit right now. Yeah. Like d- Democrats look at Republicans and they go. Well, that all that stuff's clearly bullshit because you must be a coalitional like us. So when you say all this crap about neocons and libertarianism, really, you just mean white males. That's what you mean, because that because we're thinking in terms of and it's like, no, that's not like I, I, I know a, I've gotten drunk with a lot of powerful Republicans. I've smoked some cigars with I won't, I won't mention who, but I've smoked some cigars with some powerful. They don't when, when they're drunk and the mics are off. They don't they don't do that. They still actually think ideologically. Right. And, and a lot of the problems we have domestically are just not understanding that people are thinking differently and assuming they have to think the same way we are. And to your point, Jeremy, I think that that is a very dangerous attitude to project onto rivals. And I think that that's a very good point. Like, um, uh, China has a a different set of things that it's doing than than we're doing. I don't know Chinese history as well as I know Russian history. Uh, but, but, you know, they've, they've got this whole, like, we want to be a regional power and they don't want to be invaded and they feel embarrassed for all these things. I think to understand China, you, you really need to understand Taiwan because that's going to be the next big flash plot, uh, flashpoint we have yes. and to understand that. And, like, and how we react to Ukraine, by the way, is going to depend on what happens in, yeah. in Taiwan, in my opinion. And, and they're, they're watching that as well. And, and to understand why they freak out so much about Taiwan and in an American context, we go Taiwan, that's like China light. That's like the Canada of China. Like it's I occasionally I get micro circuits from there, but there's they, they both speak Mandarin, right? It, basically, that relationship is like imagine if during the Civil War, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee had fled with their army to Rhode Island and had gone. This is the legitimate American government. All those guys on the mainland, not a real government. We're the actual America. And then Russia. I don't think went, they'd fit in very well in Providence, by the way. That no, just, that'd be kind of weird. That, say that happened. Uh, or, or they some other island, right? Sure. And then Russia, Russia came in and went. We agree. You're the legitimate American government, and we're going to give you a shit ton of guns and cannons. And maybe someday, if we ever need to use you as a springboard to invade Washington, we will. So we're going to keep funding you. That that is exactly how China feels about Taiwan. They they feel like it is a propped up fake government that is an air base America uses in case they ever need to invade, right? So that's different than how we typically think of it. Russia is another really good example. I think R- Russia has had really awful, bloody in- invasions on its Western flank now um, a couple of times where Germany's invaded it. And once before that, when when France invaded it. So they're very worried about that. Uh, and um, uh, we are, I don't think we are consuming those things. I I, I am bothered when I hop on Reddit. I just did a, uh, so on, on the political orphanage, my I just show, avoid, I, do, I just avoid Reddit because it just makes me angry. But anyway. Yeah, I, I prefer it to Twitter because Twitter's like going into a dive bar where you know people are going to throw bottles at your head. Reddit's at least 
funny and pleasant at times. Uh, uh, so on, on the political orphanage, I do the main show every week. That's the, the IR episode you most recently heard. Anybody can, can check that out. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, the most uh, recent episode from last week, but I do a bonus episode. So like Monday, I brought on a buddy of mine that fled Moscow, uh, like two days after the invasion started. And I just talked to him about, he's in contact with all of his Russian friends. He's going through their media. He's going through their polling. And it's like, are they really as close to revolution as, is, 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 Meant or is indicated on Reddit, and the answer is a very firm no. Like no. When, when I when you go on Reddit, it's all these really feel good rah rah stories about how like Putin's about to collapse, like he sent his mistress to Switzerland, and he's afraid he's going to be shot. And you get into actual like Russian like Russian polling, insofar as we can get it, most Russians are like, yeah, I think he's a dick, but what are you going to do? Mo- most Russians support the war. <laughs> he's in a Ukraine. dick, but he's our dick, so you know. Yeah, they they've they've got a kind of a begrudging relationship, uh, and they also. Um, uh, they they're pretty like there there are some very laudable people that are protesting the war in Ukraine and like my heart goes out to them I salute them anybody that's risked life and imprisonment to protest that war deserves our respect but they're not emblematic of the Russian people as a whole the Russian people as a whole based on all polling data that we have both um, institutional data and straw polls that I've looked at are like the only demographic in Russia that thinks the war is a bad idea is women ages eighteen to twenty four every other gender and age bracket is pro war or very pro war mm. uh, and 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 we're not we're we're I don't, we're we're consuming all this stuff right now that's so feel good of like yeah ukraine's going to do it and it's like eh, maybe uh but but i i think we're kind of blowing smoke up our asses yeah well andrew i've really enjoyed this man um even more than i thought i was going to cuz i was excited for this interview so for people listening um you know where should they ch- where can they check out the political orphanage and also you've got a great new book out that's out as well so if you could tell us where we can find all that Yeah, uh, Jeremy, I had a really fun time. This was great. Uh, It's very rare for people to invite me on and and get this into the weeds. So this was a lot of fun for me. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'd love to come back on. I'm one of those people that wins Jeopardy in the privacy of my own home because so much (laughs) of the information in my head is just useless anywhere else. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, as am I. We are cut from the, the same cloth in that regard. Um, yeah, check out The Political Orphanage. For anybody listening, if if you've resonated um, either with uh, me and Jeremy ranting about feeling kind of alienated from the two-party system, you can be a member of a party. What I mean by that is just, do you have friends you disagree with that you don't want to kill with a rake? Like, do you like? Do you think it's possible to live with people you disagree with? And do you get irritated with the way the media portrays everything as red versus blue? If you're in that category, you might very well be a political orphanage. And I invite you to your, your home with the rest of your fellow political orphans on my show, The Political Orphanage, where you can get where podcasts are uh, in anywhere you download them. Uh, and uh, uh, I do a lot of author interviews, but I also do a lot of policy deep dives like the IR theory thing that we're doing. About once a month, I will consume an inappropriate amount of Adderall and go to the woods for a week and research a shit ton of stuff. And then I, I distill it down for you. So check out The Political Orphanage. And in terms of books... Do I have? A, I don't have a copy handy, but uh, I wrote a a fun science fiction and humor anthology called "Inappropriately Human: Twenty One Short Stories." Um, that is kind of like Douglas Adams type stuff. If you if you like, uh, it's it's half half Twilight Zone, half Douglas Adams. So it's funny and it's sci fi. It came out in January. It's been getting good reviews. Everybody that's read it has really enjoyed it. People that have read it are now more attractive, uh, have have stronger erections, lose weight. Uh, it's really across the board good for everybody. So if if you if you're like I don't like that guy's politics, but he's really entertaining. Then go to Amazon.com and get a copy of Inappropriately Human. Very cool. For for people listening, um, the, the thing I really do want to reiterate is it is very important that we understand our history, we understand political theory, and we understand the world so that we can react to it correctly rather than just reacting by how we feel about things. So Andrew Heaton, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, man. 